Ooh, an error occurred. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, there we go. Perfect. So welcome everyone. If you're tuning in later, um, we are just about to start. We're gonna give it another minute for people to file in to the room. Oh, we already have a bunch of people. Um, so if you're watching live, we're just gonna wait a second um, before we start. But my name is Rachel, and I'm the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator at the Leventhal Map and Education Center, um, which is a lot of words to say at once. Um, and this is Dennis McCarthy. Oh, wrong way. This is Dennis McCarthy, um, who's a volunteer at the Map Center. And we are happy to be talking about Boston by Map today. So I'll give it another second. Mm -hmm. But how are you, Dennis? Good. How are you? I should. Good. I got to figure out if I point this way. Oh, I am pointing at you, even though it's the, the opposite. Okay. Yeah, it's like Zoom is. So I should look this way, look away from you to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom is flipped um, so that you see it like you're used to in a mirror, and StreamYard is not. So it's always very strange to see myself in this direction. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. I'm going to start um, with a brief. Uh, land acknowledgement. And before we start, um, I want to acknowledge that we work on, live in, and are discussing land that was the traditional and ancestral land of Native peoples. So what's now the city of Boston, European settlers called the Shawmut Peninsula, but before that, Algonquian speakers called it Mashawomic. And it was and is home to groups including the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes, the Nipmuc nations, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Today we're talking about um, land that is parkland, um, but we want to talk about um, kind of the fact that it was used by people for a very long time before it was used um, as open space by white European settlers. And the collections of the Leventhal Map and Education Center include maps that reflect or were direct tools of colonial expansion and native erasure and dispossession. So the, the atlases especially that we're going to discuss today record property ownership in the 19th and 20th centuries, which is a time um, often thought of as long after colonization in New England. But colonialism is an ongoing process, both in the time these maps were created and today. And a lot of these maps omit um, previous and contemporaneous Native groups. The land we're on today, much like the land that's documented in these maps, cannot be understood without acknowledging the genocide which took place during colonization. So today, um, tribal nations and bands are still asking for recognition and land rights from federal, state, and local governments, which it's important to, to recognize when we dive into just the settler colonialism part of this, um, this uh, presentation. So if you've never taken a look, I really recommend checking out nativeland.ca, which is a really cool digital mapping project um, that can start to develop your thinking about the way cartographies of colonialism relate to your life and where you live. So I'll drop a link to that in the comments. It shows um, a lot of different things, including uh, treaties, um, native groups and languages spoken in the place where you live today. So if you're tuning in from out of town, you should drop a comment saying like where, where you're from, whose land you're on. Um, since I mentioned um, the Boston uh, groups. So yeah, and throughout the presentation, you can leave comments here and we will be able to see them and address them. Um, so we're happy to do that and make this as interactive as possible. Cool. So without further ado, welcome to Boston by Map, um, St. Patrick's Day slash Evacuation Day yeah. edition. Okay, can you see my screen okay still, Rachel? Yeah. All right, yes, yeah. so as Rachel said, happy evacuation day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what we usually do in a, we have the same agenda for your nature, every Boston by map, uh, to talk about history through maps and then give a an example and a different example every month. Uh, today's, you out of the three green choices we offered you, uh, the, the emerald necklace, the Boston green space has got the most. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, uh, 
maps of Boston, historic maps of Boston, and where to find them online. And finally, we'll end the session to, uh, hopefully hearing from you about your project and how we can help you. So uh, you can use historic maps uh, of Boston to answer questions like what used to be here, wherever you're standing, or where is that thing you're talking about on today's map? Or how did it, some part of Boston develop over time using a series of historic maps? Uh, today's example will be the uh, some part of the uh, Emerald Necklace. The Emerald Necklace, of course, Boston's park system uh, developed starting in the late 1800s. Uh, it's pretty big. Uh, and so we're gonna just focus on the parts of it that are nearest central Boston today. Perhaps in some future session, we'll do the uh, other ones. So the common, the garden, Charles Bank and the Esplanade. Oops, I got a question. Uh, th there's some sort of books here. By the way, um, don't worry about all the links and things I'll be showing you because uh, we will have a handout that Rachel will distribute after the uh, session today, which will contain links to everything I'm going to show you. So we're going to uh, pop out of the this and you should now see, I hope, Rachel, the 1722 Bonner map of Boston. Yeah. So uh, when the Puritans arrived in 1630, uh, the what they called the Shawmut Peninsula had one European resident. His name was William Blackstone. He had been the pastor for a previous uh, colony that failed. He did not go back to England. He stayed and settled on the south slope of Beacon Hill. Uh, when the Puritans arrived, they landed in Charlestown, found that there was insufficient water supply for all of them there, and they broke up into groups that uh, created the first towns in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, Governor Winthrop led, led the group who came over to the, who was invited over to the Shawmut Peninsula by William Blackstone and founded Boston. Uh, Blackstone was a bit of a character, and uh, having a, took, he was used to living by himself, and uh, he got a little bit, felt a little bit constrained as the Puritans uh, settled on the peninsula and the colony grew. So in 1634, he left. He sold uh, the area now called the Common to the town, which is going to use it for common grazing and militia training. So here's a 1722 map of Boston, the first sort of modern looking one. And here's the Common. It's not well bounded or differentiated in this map as it would be later on. Um, here's uh, a close up of the Common. Uh, reconstructed, representing what it was in 1780. Or, uh, and uh, here you can see, you know, the, the, I guess the, you can see, first of all, this boundary on the east side, what they call Common Street, how is now Tremont Street, and trees planted along it, they call it the mall. The old elm here was a massive elm tree uh, that was around until, cut, it wasn't cut down and taken down until it was dead in 1876. Uh, it was used in colonial times for executions. They hung people there. Now, um, let me go over here. This is what the this is a view of the common in 1804 after the state house had been built. The common was at, common in the English sense. It was land that was not privately owned, but was held in common by the town and used for various productive uses. I said they grazed milk cows there. Uh, women would gather under the old elm in the early 1800s to do weekly laundry. Uh, men would bring rugs there to, uh, to beat, uh, to clean. Here you can see the cows, a you know, woman with her two children and a workman with a wheelbarrow in the background. And the state house had opened in 1795. Here's a map uh, from 1814. Now you can see the common is well-defined. There's a, you know, roads along all sides. <clears throat> Um, and there's buildings all around it. So what's happened, there's a social development here that that's, uh, plays a story in the, in, uh, on the history of the common. In the early 1800s, the wealthy residents of Boston uh, came, to, came to believe that home and work should be separated. Home was a place for family and leisure, you know, your, your workshop, your, your uh, shop or office in the, over to the east in the commercial district was where you went to work. They started building, they started moving west, putting their homes on Beacon Hill and here along Tremont Street. This long section here is uh, called, was called the, <clears throat> um, the mall. 
uh, col in a colonnade row, excuse me. It was designed by Charles Bullfinch, who also designed uh, houses on Beacon Hill for wealthy Bostonians. Uh, so they liked to, so as they moved into this area, they had a different view of what the common should be. They thought it should be simply a place of leisure and eliminate all the productive activity, all the work activity from it. And they began a campaigning to do that in the 1820s. They couldn't have done it when Boston was a town governed by town meeting, because the, the, you know, the, mo the most residents would be against that idea. But in 1821, Boston became a city with representative government. Uh, and by the late 1820s, uh, Harrison Gray Otis had become mayor. He was a leading businessman and real estate developer. So in the 1820s, there were a number of regulations put on the activities that could be performed on the common, and culminating in 1830 with the uh, uh, end of cow milk cows grazing. Families used to be able to graze their milk cow, would play a small fee. Uh, they were banished from the common because refined lady, upper class ladies didn't want to encounter a cow or its droppings in their walk along the common. So that was called the War of the Cows. So 1830 is basically when the common became a park, uh, the first park in the United States. This is the vision. This is an 1829 illustration. This is what the upper class wanted. You know, a, fine government building and this beautiful landscaped open space in front of it with no uh, working class people doing their jobs there. Now, here's the here's a, a reconstruction of the common as it was in 1850, much more developed. Uh, the elm tree is still there, but you can see now we have the streets all around it and the, uh, the plantings along, the, and you could walk all the way around the common uh, through the trees. Now, next to the common, heading out across Charles Street at this at, 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 in 1830, was still uh, tidal mud flats, except for these rope walks that had been placed there. Uh, in 1824, the rope walks were that area, that land, this main land was purchased back by the city, and the rope walks removed. And in the 1830s, they filled. There was a, a large discussion about filling those tidal mud flats. Uh, they talked into our proposals to pick a, a presidential neighborhood there or a cemetery there, but uh, the uh, wealthy people around, who used the, lived around the common, excuse me, um, <coughs> wanted to you know maintain the view you had looking west over the back bay to the hills in the distance, and so uh, they made land there, but it was just grass um, and uh, no. No building. So here you can see in this 1835 map, the main land. It doesn't go all the way out to today's Arlington Street. It went to the boundary of the uh, land owned by the city. Everything west of that was owned by the Boston Water Power Company, which had built this dam across that created Beacon Street and was using that as a basin for tide powered mills. Um, in 1837, uh, the space was leased to uh, one Horace Gray who uh, was a botanist in his spare time. He was a uh, you know, wealthy gentleman. Uh, and it was used for a horticultural garden, a so, you know, public, public garden. And then uh, this is what it looked like. This is an 1850 bird's eye view. There's the common and here's the garden, uh, public garden. In, 18, in the early 1850s, of course, this, this here in front of it is the tidal mud flats. And in the 1850s, the uh, Back Bay Project, is getting organized. And that meant that uh, the city, the Boston, the Boston Water Power Company and the state divvied up the land. And in this case, uh, the land east of the newly laid out Arlington Street was going to be uh, turned over to, let me actually go back one map, um, turned over to the city to extend the garden. Uh, there was still at this time discussions over what should be put there. One. Uh, one proposal was to actually, let me just rotate this so it matches a map today, to put into this space an extension of the Back Bay neighborhood. So here you can see Commonwealth Avenue, Newberry Street, Marlboro Street, if they had done that. They chose not to. Instead, uh, they had a design competition for a larger public garden, and this is the winning entry by George Meacham in 1859. And this is what was built. Uh, except that the building here was not. And you can see that uh, in this map. Now this line here is the old shoreline. This is the land that was added in the 1856 agreement. 
And here's the uh, implementation of Meacham's plan. Here you can get a better view of it in the bird's eye. It's right here in the foreground. And you can see the bee. This, was, this is from 1866. So you can see the uh, filling of the back bay and building of uh, uh, putting up buildings on the first block between Arlington and Berkeley has started. Now, uh, and then here's a 1900 you know, plan showing pretty much what you have today. Now, we're going to mo move now over to the Charles River. Uh, in the late 1800s, the second half of the 1800s, there were a number of ideas proposed about what to do with what they call the Charles River Basin. That's the river between uh, what's today the Museum of Science and the BU Bridge. This one is by Charles Davenport. He was responsible for all this made land on the Cambridge side. But the one, the plan that had the most in influence on the actual, what actually happened, let me get actually out of here a bit, was from 1894 by Charles Elliott. Well, he was a landscape architect. He'd study under Olmsted, famous uh, designer of parks in Boston. And he had green space on both sides of the river. <clears throat> uh, and if you look closely at the map, though, when you get up here north of what's now the Longfellow Bridge downstream, there's a park called Charles Bank. That wasn't a proposal. That actually existed. Uh, it had been designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, in uh, 1888, this is the plan he published. Uh, it had it was very elaborate. It had up uh, here on the downstream end an outdoor gymnasium and track for men and boys. At the upstream end, a, another outdoor gymnasium and playground for women and girls. And in between, this beautifully planted space with uh, <clears throat> trees, paths, benches, lights. Here's a one picture of uh, the uh, Charles Riverside. There's a couple others showing um, the men's playground facilities at the downstream end. Here's some kids playing, family playing out on the on a berm that was in the middle. Just to give you a more of a map side view, this is uh, what that section between the Longfellow Bridge and the Museum of Science today looked like just before the park was built and then after it was built. It's quite lovely. Uh, now, in the first decade of the 20th century, we're, you know, they got started on fulfilling more of Charles Elliott's vision by you know, putting, the, putting a park uh, farther upstream. Uh, so there were a couple um, obstacles to that. First of all, the Charles River was a tidal estuary. That meant that at low tide in the harbor, water, fresh water flowed downstream through the basin. But at high tide in the harbor, salt water would back up into it. So the, uh, the, the, there were, the river was lined by tidal mudflats. You can see them here, which were exposed at low tide, as in this picture, and then completely underwater at high tide. Uh, the other obstacle was the sewer system. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, um, the sewage lines dumped raw sewage into the shoreline. They saw the lines ran perpendicular to the shoreline and dumped raw sewage. Each of these little brown puffs is where raw sewage was dumped into the Charles River. So at low tide with the sewage exposed, it was not a very nice place. In fact, those people who lived along Beacon Street in the back bay tended to be wealthy enough to own summer homes and they would get out of the city in the summer. So what happened is in the first decade of the uh, 20th century, uh, there were two big civil engineering projects, infrastructure projects. The first one uh, was the Charles River Dam. So they created a dam uh, where it is today. This is a picture of it. Um, I'm gonna go make it bigger for a second, if I can. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So here's the dam. Oops. Uh, the dam was uh, had a seven. It was an earthen dam with a seven-acre park on top, designed by Guy Lowell. This is a this is a lock that ships would use to go up and down stream. And then below that, here is part of the uh, Charles Bank Park. Unfortunately, uh, the park was have, had to be heavily modified. Uh, 
uh, the, uh, they, they, they dug a trench right through the middle of the park for the interceptors that they built for the sewer that would cut off those that flow into the, into the um, river. And they, so they had to cut a trench right through the middle of Charles Bank Park. It was rebuilt also, uh, to a much simpler design by Guy Lowell. So you don't have as much planting, uh, nor did you have the berm in the middle that you had before. Uh, upstream of the Longfellow Bridge, they built a 300 foot, 300 foot wide Boston embankment. Here's an aerial view of it from the 20s. And then uh, once you go around the bend farther upstream, it was only 100 feet wide and very plain, as you can see here. None of the amenities that you found in Charles Bay. This was a compromise. Um, you know, the landscape architects wanted something elaborate like Charles Bank, but the residents of the Back Bay didn't want anything at all. They did not, you know, Charles Bank was heavily used by the uh, uh, residents of the West End who were immigrants densely packed in there. Uh, the residents of the Back Bay, did, uh, Beacon Street here, did not want working class people cutting through, you know, their neighborhood to get to the park. Uh, there was this wonderful quote about the, their view uh, at the time. It said, you may come down and look at the basin if you wish, but you must walk and you must walk in the sun. You must not. You, met, you must not have any public boathouse, bathhouses, trees, restaurants, or anything of the kind. So this is quite plain. Uh, not not exactly what uh, Charles Eliot had in mind. In the nineteen late nineteen twenties, uh, or in the nineteen twenties, though, we get a step closer to uh, uh, what Eliot had in, had in mind. Uh, now the driving force behind the building the dam was a man named. Uh, uh, James Jackson Storrow. Uh, he was he passed away by the twenties, but his widow Helen Storrow offered the city one million a one million dollar gift to to, to improve this park, uh, which they accepted. Uh, there were the tra the transportation people at the time wanted to. Well, I was getting ahead. Let's just talk about that. So here is the uh, right here is the plan uh, by landscape architect Arthur Shercliffe for what the expanded park would look like. And here we can see on this map, uh, here's the old simple Boston embankment, very narrow that we saw in the picture. It's much wider now. Uh, and what, what he did was to, um, you know, they built a lot of land extending the shoreline out. It had sloped bank down to the water rather than that seawall, much nicer, uh, much more trees. It had a lagoon, which you can't quite see in this view. Let me pop it up here so we can see in this old aerial, here's the lagoon. It also had these break, uh, breakwaters for the community boating area to make the, the uh, water still for people getting in and out of the boats there. Uh, so this was completed by 1935, uh, and uh, that's what you see here. Now, after World War II, however, you know the automobiles won out over the Storrow's intent. Uh, the um, so they actually took land to make a highway that would run along here. Let's actually show it here. It, it ran on the inland side of the park and they added land here. You can see this big set of islands. So to compensate for the land taken for this highway here, let's zoom in so you can see the, see the better. Here's the high, highway with the cars running along here and up here. Um, and you can see here was the plan for it. Now, they, did, did Now, Mrs. Storrow had resisted successfully in the 1920s and 30s, having a highway put through her through the park that she donated a million dollars for. But she was she had passed away by now, and so uh, they went ahead, built this highway, and to add insult, and they did not refund the one million dollar donation to Helen Storrow's estate. Instead, they had insult to injury. They re they named the road Storrow Drive. So that's the quick version. Why don't I get back to seeing you? So do we have any, any questions or comments about all of this? That went by sort of fast. 
Well, we had um, one comment from someone who, who might have left already, Megan, um, who was asking about city infrastructure improvements that had links to public health and um, such as water, food safety, parks, and housing. So we're think, kind of focusing on parks that. today. But. Yeah, we did get the brown puffs map, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the uh, sewage map. Um, yeah, and I think um, another, another interesting consideration is one of the reasons that parks started to be built in the early 19th century um, was the, the um, what's it called? Miasmatic theory of disease. Yes, that was one reason that the uh, that the there was resistance to putting thing put it, building anything on the land that's now the public garden. If you put up a residential neighborhood, they thought, or even or even land with trees that would interfere with the uh, uh, the breeze coming that you know normally comes from the west, and they thought that the uh, the fresh air breeze was essential to good health. Mm -hmm. And if you had, uh, if, you, if you didn't have a breeze, then the, the miasma would come off of those tidal mud flats and cause disease. Exactly. And they weren't totally wrong. <laughs> 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 they were a little wrong, but they had the right idea about one thing that was making them sick. All right. Well, let me just go back to the presentation for a second and finish. And we'll, we'll, we'll sure. keep going and see if we had elicits more feedback. Um, so. Going back to here. So uh, we've seen a lot of different kinds of maps and images here. So we see we, we saw some old uh, sheet maps from the 1700s and 1800s. We saw atlases and atlas scope. Uh, we saw bird's eye views from the 1800s and aerial photographs from the 1900s. Um, and especially maps like the brown puff, you know, sewage map. Uh, so there's lots of different kinds of ma uh, maps and artifacts that you could use in telling your story, you know, through maps. Uh, there's, if you go to the Leventhal map website, there are, and, and search for maps of Boston, you're gonna get overwhelmed by the number of entries you'll find. So I put together this short list of, you know, uh, places to start. This is based on, taking a class from Nancy Seasholes, who wrote the Gaining Ground book, which is a definitive account of uh, land making in Boston, and, uh, and also uh, with input from Peter Grimm, uh, the former curator of maps at the Leventhal Map Center. So the, there's a set of reconstructed maps. You'll get links to all of these uh, when we get the handout out. Uh, I'd show the shoreline at various periods in uh, Boston history. Uh, the Bonner map we saw, the page map is during the American Revolution. The Hales map from 1814 we saw. Uh, and then the insurance atlases are what we were looking at in uh, the atlas scope. Now, uh, there's a, if you want to you know, get hold of digital versions of these various maps, you know, the first two places to go are uh, the Leventhal Map Center's uh, websites, atlas scope and digital collection. And I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to uh, give you a guided tour through those two areas. Okay, so um, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, Atlas Scope, which is our kind of digital exploration of um, the atlases in our collection. Let me make this the right shape. Um, so what we've done is we basically have um, these really beautiful plates of atlases, which actually I can show you one that I brought today. So this is a plate from one of our old atlases. This is the 1938, which we actually just saw on Atlascope. Um, it's really beautiful. I love the colors on this one, especially. Um, But hopefully seeing just that one plate, you can kind of appreciate the difficulty of dealing with these incredibly large maps um, that are in such large format. Um, you have to be able to um, kind of navigate between separate atlases and compare the years to each other, um, which requires a lot of table space um, and also a lot of care. And they also have like an index page like any atlas that you then have to compare 
you have to look at like which section of the map you want um, and flip to the right page. And the pages change over the years. So um, what's on one plate in one year won't necessarily be on the same corresponding plate in the next year of the atlas. So what we've done is we've digitally transformed these atlases, basically um, cut around the edges, not literally, cut around the edges of the, um, of the maps and stitch them together so that you have a fuller picture of um, the maps of Boston. So Atlascope has these three options for how to kind of explore. You can click Find Me, which will um, track your GPS. So this is actually really cool if you're walking around the city. Um, you can have it track you and you can explore like, what was this building in 1874? What was here in 1938? You can also search places. Um, one caveat is that you can only search um, modern locations and addresses. You can't search uh, old addresses and some have changed over the years. Or you can start at BPL, which will drop you at Copley. So let's do that for now. It takes you to the oldest layer usually. So in this case, it's 1874, which is this F.W. De Beers and Company map or FW beers, um, so you can choose different maps from this drop-up list. So the one that I just showed you um, in person is this 1938, really beautiful map of Boston. You can see these parks that we were just talking about, um, as well as like all of the fancy places in Back Bay up here. So here is the Charles River Embankment and Storrow Memorial Embankment is what it's called at the time. Here's this great, there's like um, actually bathrooms, public bathrooms mm -hmm. on the Esplanade at the time, which is a really nice amenity that, that no longer exists. If you continue a little bit farther downstream, you'll see the music oval, I think. On this map. Oh, no, I guess it's not on here. It's got the, this atlas is a little bit chopped off at the river. There's more land. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these are just like oh. very beautiful. What were you going to say? If you, if you go back just a tiny bit, I can see the musical right there on the left. Oh. Uh, yep. Yeah. Where your, your cursor is pointing. That was the predecessor of the hat shell. Oh yeah. Yeah, too bad it's not labeled. That's very, very cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just kind of wanted to show you this resource, um, which is um, really beautiful and really useful. And if you have anything that you want us to look up in particular on this map, we are happy to do it. The other um, thing that Dennis was talking about is our collections website, which I want to show you briefly. Um, so like you said, if you just search Boston, you're going to come up with a lot of results. Um, we have, yeah, so this says 7,951 results. Um, at the Map Center, we have just under, I think, a quarter million maps, um, in general, or in, in total, but, um, not all of them are digitized, unfortunately. There's a, a limit on how many we have digitized. But I think that 8,000 maps is a good place to start um, for Boston. So there's like a really wide variety of maps. As you can see, just like perusing here, there are um, kind of modern maps like this one down here, which is by the um, Boston Public, um, the Boston Plans and Development Authority. There are older um, BRA maps, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which is the predecessor of the BPDA. Um, we've got atlases. We have um, really beautiful pictorial maps, um, bird's eye views, um, kind of different different perspective to look over. So um, you can definitely uh, filter in a lot of different ways. I recommend in particular filtering by date. Um, I always think that's a very fun thing to do. Um, 
we don't have a lot of 20th century maps. That's a place that we're trying to kind of develop in our collection. Um, but there are copyright restrictions on that. So we've had a little bit of, uh, we have to wait a little bit longer before we can get a large 20th century collection of, of privately created maps. But one thing that I wanted to point out that um, I just mentioned in passing is the Boston Redevelopment Authority collection, which is newly digitized. These are maps done by the, like I said, the predecessor of the BPDA. Um, a lot of these are kind of conjectural, the way that some of the maps of the, um, the parks that Dennis just showed us were like kind of um, hopeful <laughs> planning maps of the area and not necessarily um, exactly what the landscape became. Aspirational. Aspirational, that's a good word for it. Aspirational maps. Um, so yeah, these are just really beautiful. They're very interesting for kind of studying urban change in Boston and um, the way that that the landscape of the city has changed over the, over the years. So, um, I want to go back to me for a second and I'll finish off the places to get stuff. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the places, so there's a couple other places. If you don't find what you're looking for at the Leventhal, there's a couple other places to go. One is the Massachusetts Real Estate Atlas Digitization Project, uh, where they have the state has uh, digitized a large number of atlases. Uh, there's a list here. They start with atlases of the entire state, then county level atlases, and then finally individual town atlases. So you can find uh, and a lot of them by Boston. Those are ones that are in Boston are mostly already in Atlas scope. But if you you know if you want looking for your town that you live in, you might find you know an atlas here that'll uh, give you information you need for your project. The other place you can go is the what's called what they call the Boston Atlas on the BPDA side, Boston Planning and Development Agency. That's the successor to the BRA, and they have a number of uh, uh, atlases and other things, including aerial photos, uh, that are uh, and they use uh, a site called Map Junction, similar to Atlas Scope for their uh, uh, letting you do the overlay thing. So those are the other two places to go. That's taken a little bit too long to come up, so we'll just abandon that. And that's sort of the what it for what I have to say in the this part of the pre event. Now we're sort of looking at looking at you and hoping that you'll uh, ask us some questions or tell us what your what project you have in mind, and maybe we can give you some help. Yeah, so everyone, um, I just dropped the feedback form into the chat for you to fill out. Um, but before you do that, if you have any questions, if you have a research project that you're doing, we'd love to talk about it or help you with it. Um, if you have an address that you want us to look up on Atlascope, I'm also happy to do that as well. Um, I think uh, a good place to start is always at Copley. Um, but I'm happy to look up any addresses that people are interested in. Oh, thank you, Peter, who says that the Atlas scope is amazing. I agree. I can, um, show you guys kind of how, how the, let me find a good seam. So you can see here, um, kind of how, how it's stitched together. Um, that this is one plate and this is another plate where we've chopped it off here so that you can see that it's Dartmouth Street on both sides. Um, let me zoom out. Something that I really love about Alloscope is um, just kind of zooming around. Bay. Um, so this is Restoration Hardware today, but it used to be the Boston Society of Natural History, which explains why it's such a beautiful building, um, which I think is has always really confused me personally. 
Um, <laughs> there's um, a lot of really great detail on these maps as well. So here you can see like uh, windows coming out of the like bay windows coming out of the um, the buildings. Something that people might not might not be super obvious that you can do is that down at the bottom of the page, you can click on about this map and it'll give you all of the metadata information as well as an ability to, um, to download the actual footprint, which is georeferenced. So it has the geographic data um, embedded in it. Um, or you can actually just go to this plate um, in digital collections. Um, oh, it's only sharing that tab, so I can't show you. <laughs> um, let me... So then um, it shows you kind of the, the boundaries between the plates. Here, this is a good thing to look at, which is the whole city divided up into the plates. So then if you were interested in, say, the north end, you could zoom in here, click on this and then view this plate in digital collections, which is taking a while to load. So this is um, a really beautiful example with Quincy Market. I think we talked about this plate or this area last time, Dennis, right? Or the time before? Yes. Yeah. So they're just like really detailed. You can even see like where the Sumner Tunnel comes through here um, under the North End um, in 1938. You can also, um, like I said, you can download the geo-referenced version or you can download the full uncompressed um, full resolution scan of it, which is super detailed. So you can actually see like the paper grain um, on this map. You can see here where the fold is in the, in the plate. And um, yeah, so we have all of our metadata here. You can see um, the map overlay as well. So this is kind of like a mini version of Atlas Scope. Also, I just want to mention that you can do this with any of our maps. So you can always click on map overlay right here. And if there isn't one, you can do it yourself. So let me show you how to do that just briefly. Um, so let's look at non-geo reference maps. Um, let's say you wanted to georeference this map, which would be very interesting because it's a very weird projection. Um, you would click georeference this map right here. You would sign in. <laughs> and then you can actually click, um, click on locations here and click on the same location on a, a modern map and line them up and you can contribute to our georeference collection. We have a question, Rachel. I do have a question. Steven says, I'm doing a presentation on the Mass Pike extension through Newton and Bolton. Where can I get maps? That is a great question. Um, you I think, can, I think sorry, go meant, ahead, Dennis. I think he meant Boston, not Bolton. Bolton, maybe Boston. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we can help you with this. We actually have two reference librarians who are very happy to help you, one of whom is a GIS librarian and one of whom kind of manages the rest of our collections um, and our, our older stuff mostly. Um, yeah, should be Boston. You were right, Dennis. Um, so you can always email us at info at um, We're also happy to... Um, to work with you on any of your research projects, whether they're um, historic or modern research um, with maps. 
So you should be able to get maps. You should check out our digital collections first, but we're also happy to just like work through it with you <laughs> and see what maps that we can provide and what maps that you would have to find somewhere else. That's a fascinating story that he's working on too. His, uh, the, the original transportation plan had the turnpike ending at the, I believe it's at the uh, Brighton Alston interchange uh, because mm -hmm. they, they didn't want the, the turnpike extension actually going all the way into the central artery because that would dump way too much traffic on the central artery and congest it. But the Secretary of Transportation, William Callahan, was a, you know, I build highways at any cost guy. And he he rammed it through. And, and uh, you know, years later, we had the big dig to correct the problem that he had created by connecting those dots. I have a fun little thing to show if you want to send it back to me for a second. Sure. Um, so let me get, so this is, we showed you, I showed you this map of the common and garden from 1900. It's an interesting part right here on the bottom. Uh, in, uh, this is in 1897, the, uh, the Tremont tunnel, the, uh, streetcar tunnel opened. Uh, and that was, you know, Usually, it's usually said is Boston had the first subway in America that opened in 1897. While the subway, uh, there was a subway station here at the corner of Tremont and Boylston. You can see there's the entrance right there. And then the subway proceeded underground along Boylston until it got near the end of the common. And then it popped up into the middle of Boylston Street, which you can see in this photo here. So this is Boylston Street. Whoop, too much. <laughs> here's Boylston Street, here's the Boston Common, and here was the portal where trains came in and out of that tunnel. And it wasn't until 1912 that the, uh, the it's and so trains continued along Boylston Street and uh, streetcars continued along Boylston Street down the middle of the street. It wasn't until 1912 that the Boylston Street tracks got moved underground. This portal remained open until 1941, which is when the uh, tunnel for the Huntington Avenue streetcars opened. Okay, that was it. Look at those trees. Yeah, they're big. That's beautiful. And uh, they actually, uh, okay. Anything else? Well, we don't good, have any more questions right now. Well, good I'm luck. I'm trying to think if, if yeah, there's any fine. more resources I should. There is one more resource that is really good to know about. Um, which is Digital Commonwealth, which is where a lot of the the pictures in my presentations come from. Um, many of the ones I showed too. And the ones that Dennis showed too. So um, this is like a collaborative site with um, collections from museums and libraries across Massachusetts, um, including the BPL, which includes our collections. So. If you looked up maps of Boston, um, you would come up with a lot of maps that are in our collection, but also maps that aren't. Um, so it's, and ooh, this is really fun. <laughs> I really like, I really like this description, flanked by two unidentified men. <laughs> um, so this is kind of an example of like what you'll find if you just uh, mess around with Digital Commonwealth. Um, I think that this is really great um, as a, a kind of resource for, especially photography collections, but also for maps, um, also for all sorts of other things, including um, like other archives. Um, there's like a really great collection of W.E.B. Du Bois um, letters on here to to get non-mappy for a second this is really beautiful sorry i got i got distracted by how cute this is so as you can see there's a lot of different ways to define uh, mapping and a lot of different ways of mapping <laughs> a, a landscape this is really cool i've never seen this one before
It's from the American Textile History Museum. Cool. All right, well, that's pretty much all we have for everyone today. Um, if you have any more questions, please let us know. Definitely fill out the feedback form, which I'll, um, which I posted in the chat. Um, we're happy to kind of modify this to whatever people are interested in. And we'll do it again in a month, probably, um, with different maps and different things to show you. Cool. Any parting words, Dennis? Happy evacuation day. <laughs> Happy evacuation day, everybody. Stay in Boston. <laughs> All right. See you guys later.